learned to speak was not English, uh, it was Polish. So there you are, there's uh, something in common. I must admit that I quickly gave up on my Polish speaking abilities, which my mother told me was about when I was three years old. So please, if any of you speak Polish, don't, don't speak to me in that language. Um, I'm going to be uh, discussing uh, transfusion medicine, uh, which has been a favorite of mine for a long time. And uh, it will eke out during my presentation uh, why I feel qualified to some extent to discuss this important topic that's important to all of us in medicine. Um, for the first uh, third of my presentation will be information that I have updated, that I have been giving uh, for years. And then the last two thirds of the lecture, especially the uh, last third, will emphasize only uh, the literature that's occurred in the last two years. So my goal is to uh, update you uh, with regard to the status of transfusion medicine. And uh, that, once again, will occur mainly in the last, uh, in the middle third and the last third of the presentation. So for those of you that are familiar with transfusion medicine, please bear with me a little bit for the first third of this presentation. I should also tell you there are several reasons why I feel qualified to do this, one of which is uh, for 30 years uh, I chaired the transfusion committee at UCSF and so had access to an enormous amount of information. And there will be several other reasons that will come up in this uh, presentation. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to uh, begin in reviewing the literature and uh, em emphasize uh, an article that I thought was excellent uh, in JAMA that sort of outlined the, blood the status of blood transfusions in the world, and then I'll quickly get to the United States. 80% of the world's population has access to 20% of the world's safe blood. So whenever you travel and you happen to get into an injury, uh, especially in third world countries, you should be careful about the blood transfusions you might have. It is amazing to me, but I'm quoting this directly out of the article, 150,000 pregnancy related deaths could be prevented by access to safe blood. Only 30% of countries have nationwide transfusion services and 50% of donors are from family or paid donors, which are well recognized to be an increased source of infectivity and other problems associated with transfusions. Uh, people die uh, or have uh, serious problems with, whoops, serious problems with hepatitis B, C, HIV, which is, again is emphasized in this same article. Uh, for many, many years, uh, I used to emphasize uh, infectious diseases as the or transmission of disease by blood transfusions as the major, major item that we have to deal with. And that is no longer, I really feel very guilty saying this, but no longer the case in most situations, as you will learn. There are other problems to worry about, but for the first time in that I've been involved with this in over 30 years, uh, infectious disease is not a major problem. Now, I will have a couple of slides to cover infectious disease before we get into the second topic, which will be, why do people die from transfusions? So when you decide to give a transfusion, you need to know what they die from as far as transfusions are concerned. Without any question, the two new items, the two most important new items, are as, uh, our donors. And it's turning out, I'll give you the conclusion, it's turning out uh, that uh, male donors are the, I'm not about to, especially after my 25 years of being chair at UCSF, I'm not about to want to get into any gender issues. I'm just telling you what the literature says, so don't shoot it, but male donors um, and women who have uh, not been pregnant are the safest donors, and uh, you will get into that. I'll be getting into that strictly from the literature. None of this is my own opinion. <laughs> All right, and uh, also the duration of storage in the last two years has become increasingly important. 
And those of you that read the literature quite closely with blood transfusions already know most of which I'm going to be uh, presenting. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to uh, first talk about infectious uh, transmission for just a moment and then uh, move on. So many problems with transfusions are related to infections. And in 1985, just to pick a year, there's a special reason for it because it was 1985 when I was assigned to the uh, NIH uh, study section on blood transfusions. And at that time, it was mainly due to infectivity from blood and hepatitis rate was 10% and HIV was 0.5% transmission. Blood was dangerous for that reason in those days. And so if we then look at the numbers, and this is a very busy slide, and I'm going to simplify it. I used to go line by line by line, but basically there are two pieces of information with uh, each one, such as I HIV. The window period is that time uh, of which the uh, donor becomes infected and then uh, tra uh, transmits it. And in any event, all of these uh, diseases are in fact very, very rare. It is very rare for anyone to get any one of these things from blood. There has been um, a concern about Chagas disease in Southern California in particular, and I would imagine in the San Joaquin Valley you are worried about that also. But in any event, now there's an assay that detects it, and so that should be no longer. You know, you're, are, do you know something that I don't know about it? In the green, no. Okay. Anyway, the, uh, I think that the risk of Chagas disease from blood transfusions is rather rare now because there's an assay uh, to detect it. So, uh, why uh, are infectious disease transmission not as much a problem? And it's clearly the assays that are used, and that is molecular testing, viral inactivation, mostly uh, molecular testing. And so West Nile virus is a classic example. Whoops, what did I do? Uh, West Nile virus is a classic example of how rapidly we can now act. And that is when something pipes up, uh, we can now develop a test almost always that would detect it and then virtually eliminate it from the donor pool. And this is taken uh, from an article that was in the New England Journal. So this is a wonderful story with West Nile virus and how it was a major problem with blood transfusions and it basically got solved because of the science and the development of such a specific tests. Okay, now we're gonna move to the second item and the second item is uh, why do people die? And what I've done is to go through the literature and collect this and most of it I have to say is from FDA reporting. So every year the FDA will report the transfusion fatalities in the United States and I've taken that data. I'm sorry to say I don't have the 2009 uh, data yet. But you can see that trolley has become a major cause of transfusion related deaths. And so what I've done is separate, this is the uh, three year data uh, percent of the total. And then this happens to be 2008 and the percent of the total for 2008. Hemolytic transfusion reaction, non-ABO, microbial infections, I think I, I keep hitting this button by mistake, uh, microbial infections, uh, he, uh, hemolytic transfusion reaction, ABO related, transfusion overload, and there are rare cases of anaphylaxis, and I'll show you one that was reported uh, recently. So. Let's uh, bring you up to date uh, with regard to hemolytic transfusion reaction. And I put this down because I think most of you know that hemolytic transfusion reactions are either from the recipient and identification error, sample collected from an incorrect patient, or a blood bank a clerical error. That is to say, these are all errors. They still do happen, but not very often. And I decided to add item um, I don't know why these shifted to numbers. Uh, you can tell when I made up the slide myself. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why the one and the twos are there. I've just noticed that for the first time. But our last transfusion committee meeting at UCSF was a week ago, 
And so I added this. And these conclusions are not correct for UCSF, uh, even though they are for the rest of the country, in that we've not had any hemolytic transfusion reactions for quite a few years, except uh, for group O platelets to type A patients, two cases of hemolysis in that particular situation. And uh, please don't ask me to explain this in any more detail because you'll go over my head, but that's what was reported at our last transfusion committee. Okay, trolley needs to be uh, updated, and we're now going to be getting into uh, the gender of the donor. Uh, whoops, <coughs> press the wrong button. Uh, let's see if I can get back to where I was. Uh, by doing it, let's see. Uh, how do I get, let's see, I have to, pre you're gonna do it for me. I can do it on my own computer, but okay, thank you. Um, leading cause of death uh, associated with transfusions. Uh, the incidence uh, is about uh, three in 10,000 with male, uh, excuse me, is three in 10,000 with a mixed uh, donor pool and one in 10,000 uh, with male donors alone or females who have not uh, been pregnant and associated with all blood products but especially uh, fresh frozen plasma. And so clinically I'm quite sure that you know this quite well and I don't need to really go into it but clearly it's the absence of left atrial hypertension separate from hydrostatic pulmonary edemia, high protein content in the edema fluid that comes from uh, the lungs. And I, I'm sure that uh, you've dealt with this uh, many times. So the definition of uh, trolley uh, I think should be well known by all. And uh, it requires a diagnosis of acute lung injury six hours after transfusion and, and with uh, acute lung, without acute lung injury risk factors delayed trolley syndrome, so on and so forth. I think you know this. And when I made this slide up, uh, the donor pool uh, was not an issue at that time. And so it was use of leukoreduction reduction and younger blood, that is blood that has not been stored uh, very long, will probably decrease the incidence of ARDS. And the references you will begin to notice are more recent ones, and this appeared in anesthesiology in 2009. So um, trauma and AARDS and acute lung injury, early transfusion and, and, and red blood cells and FFP are independent dose-related risk factors, significant only with more than five units of blood. Uh, keep going down, fresh frozen plasma is an independent variable, uh, so on and so forth. And the references for this uh, actually are in the journal Anesthesiology. And in 2009, anesthesiology, the journal anesthesiology was loaded with blood transfusion uh, topics. I'm going through this uh, pretty rapidly because I think you know most of it, and that is uh, that fresh frozen plasma, and I have up here now a conclusion, fresh frozen plasma appears to be an emerging and dominant risk for trolley, and this once again came from this particular uh, reference. So. Uh, recent key information regarding uh, trolley, the incidence is decreased by the exclusion of female plasma donors. Leukopenia is the first laboratory sign, increased protein in the edema fluid, and uh, with excessive intravascular volume, edema fluid will be uh, decreased. So, okay, now let's get into the evidence. In 2008, 20 donors produced 16 trolley cases in 2008, and 13 were women. And uh, the AABA, American Association of Blood Banks, recommends women who have not been pregnant and male donors and, and male donors uh, be the ones that, who should uh, be, I'm not saying this very well, the point is you want the donor pool to be males and women who have not been uh, pregnant. Okay, now trolley and other blood products. Um, so should you regulate the donor pool for all blood products? 
And once again, don't shoot the messenger on this. I'm just telling you what uh, the policy is at UCSF, and I believe it is the policy that exists in many other places. Um, platelets, uh, should you attempt to regulate the donor? The answer is yes, but not always, because platelets are often in short supply. And so we tend to be a little bit more flexible with our donor pool when we're after platelets. Um, packed red cells are okay because there's a minimal amount of plasma present. And at UCSF, uh, maternal transfusion has, uh, increased the risk of trolley in pediatric patients. And so that's another alteration about which I know very little. But that's w been one of our policies. Okay, I'm going to switch uh, to platelets. And this is a particular case report of platelet-induced sepsis and uh, is self-explanatory and I don't need to really go through uh, all of it other than uh, giving the platelets called hy caused hypotension, refractory pressure, respiratory failure, acidosis, and uh, this was uh, cultured out of the, uh, uh, as a cause of the pneumonia. And why am I going through this? And the reason I'm going through this is we at UCSF believe that we're really terrific and everything we do, this occurred at UCSF. Mm -hmm. And so my point is we have lots of problems too, and uh, this is not the only case that occurred, by the way. And so most blood transfusion bacterial contaminations are in platelets. I think this is a problem that most blood banks now have largely conquered, but you should know that it happens when you do have a fever, you should suspect it either be uh, platelets or uh, trolley, and uh, is cultured platelets successful? The answer is partially. I have no down, but the answer is partially. About a thousand uh, contaminated platelets given annually in the United S States, uh, with only uh, 10 to 40 percent actually causing clinical problems. In 2004 to 7, I don't have the 2008 data. 20 to 27 reactions, three to five deaths. So it has been a problem. I think most blood banks have taken care of it. Remember that platelets are stored at room temperature. They have to be in order to sustain platelet function. And uh, there are uh, detection tests, uh, which is what is listed here, and that's what's used to determine whether uh, the platelets are culture negative. Whoops. So uh, the rule is if a patient has a fever within six hours after receiving platelets, then it is platelet-induced sepsis until proven otherwise. Remember, six hours with platelets. So it's trolley or platelet uh, contamination is really the uh, issue. Um, I don't know whether everyone knows this, and I'm the only one that's a little slow on the draw. It used to be that our terminology was that we'd give six to 10 platelet concentrates uh, when we had a platelet problem, especially for massive blood transfusions. Uh, that's now old terminology. And now uh, you give one unit, and one unit is equal to six platelet concentrates. I think all blood banks across the country use this terminology now. So uh, I'm going to move just quickly to uh, coagulation. Um, and uh, what we do, and it's also dealing with the uh, ASA practice guidelines. Um, part of it is talking of a visit like this is talking to residents. And if I, as somebody who's been around a long, long time, I've had a wonderful career. And uh, part of it is just taking advantage of every situation that comes along my way. And I said, gee, how can I? What can I do here that will be lots of fun, might achieve something? And uh, I will never tell you what the names are, but the Vietnam conflict, uh, let's step back a little bit and compare it a little bit to uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Vietnam conflict, there were 20 or 50,000 Americans that got killed. There were 500,000 American troops there at a time. So it was huge. And so there, this happened right when I was a resident. And uh, there were three of us that, that were vulnerable. Remember, there was a draft then. 
So when you finished your residency, and especially if you were a male, your chances of getting picked to go there were pretty high. And so two of the three of us had fathers that had influence and uh, worked it around so that this didn't happen. I didn't have uh, such a father. And so um, I went to um, Washington and uh, decided that there was a thing called Da Nang Lung. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's acute respiratory syndrome. Um, and uh, I heard that this was going on someplace in Vietnam. I knew I was going. There was no way of getting out of it. So I volunteered to go in the Navy. And so I went to Washington and uh, talked with the head of research in Washington in the Navy. And he said, get yourself assigned to Da Nang because that's where the most casualties are, that's where the action is, and that's where the Da Nang lung research is going on. So I went to the detailer, uh, which the guy who's assigned it, and uh, everybody, he told me, everybody that come to him was trying to get out of going to Vietnam, and he said, what can I do with you? And I said, I'd like to talk about, I'm gonna enter the service in July, where I go. Where do you wanna go? I said, I wanna go to Vietnam. And he thought I was crazy. And um, the fact is, I knew that the odds of me going there were 99%. And so I said, he said, okay, uh, you could go to Vietnam. And I said, could I pick where I go? One of the best, as I look back at my career, this was probably one of the smartest moves I ever made. And, uh, and I said, I'd like to go to Da Nang. He said, you know, the action there's pretty hot. And, and I said, I know that. So anyway, I went. And so this is a picture from Da Nang. It's uh, recently um, appeared in anesthesiology, and I'll tell you why that is. And that's a uh, helicopter, and most of the casualties came by helicopter. That's a place called Marble Mountain, which doesn't look very big. I thought it was huge. Uh, and that's where the Viet Cong hit out at night. And anyway, so that was uh, Vietnam. And so I got there and um, asked, we started giving the first anesthetic I ever gave, and I'll get off of this real quickly. I was uh, jet lagged and I went in and there was a Vietnamese that required anesthesia. And um, I was culturally deprived. And so I went to intubate this patient and all the teeth were black. I'd never seen anybody with black teeth and that's from betel nut. And then I opened the mouth and there was a worm coming out of the, uh, <laughs> the esophagus and I closed the mouth. And, uh, and then I said, oh Jesus, and I was jet lagged and I thought, I'm gonna be here a year. Uh, this is, and the surgeon was from South Carolina and he used a four letter word that I won't use. He says, Ron, he says, just get the damn tube in. They've all got those. And so that was the beginning. But as time went on, uh, there, it's amazing how dedicated people were there. And we took care of zillions of casualties. And I started to wonder whether the transfusion protocol was correct or not. And they simply took it from uh, a civilian protocol. And so they allowed me, with the help of a laboratory and everything like that, to do quite a few studies. And uh, one of them was the coagulation effects of massive blood transfusions. And that study was honored as a classic paper in anesthesiology last year. And that's where this picture uh, came from. And uh, so for me, when I got back and I had published all those papers uh, on it in JAMA and so on and so forth, I got assigned to be on the FDA Blood and Blood Products Advisory Committee. I got assigned to uh, be ultimately on the NIH uh, study section. And I owe the military a lot for letting me do that and giving me the freedom to do that. And so uh, I get a little, and I'm gonna be honored by the military anesthesiologist. And so I've gone back, been asked to come back to Vietnam by the North Vietnamese. And so I've had a wonderful, I won't bore you with the rest of it. Uh, but um, I had a surgeon come and said, gee, it was great you were able to do all that. and." you remember what we did? And I remember that whole year of never questioning the quality of care. And the surgeon reminded me, when I go through what I have to go through at UCSF, committee meetings and on and on, he said, do you remember how many committee meetings we had when we were in Vietnam that whole year? 
I said, no. He says, we never had a committee meeting. <laughs> so the whole year we did research, did clinical care, and it was wonderful. Anyway, out of that, thanks for uh, being my therapist for a moment, but uh, um, part of that study, uh, was this was published in the Annals of Surgery, was to simply correlate platelet count when patients actually had a bleeding problem. And when I, we defined that, I got a corpsman, I said, you watch the field and you tell me when you, and I defined to him what it was. So the surgeon didn't tell it, I didn't do it. That's what we did. And so we were the first ones that identified the 50,000 platelet count to be uh, a key and that was done in Vietnam. And by the way, there was no computers, there were no computers. And so when the military understood how important this was, they would fly me to Taiwan uh, and I'd have two pilots in a plane, and they flew me to Taiwan so I could go to the Naval Library and look up the literature uh, on it. So the, as time goes on, uh, even though the military, uh, God, I'm anxious to get out of there, uh, my gratitude to the military and what they allowed me to do is enormous. So uh, it was a 50,000 platelet count. Uh, and now packed red cells versus whole blood. Uh, we used whole blood in those days. I thought it uh, has been insane to keep insisting on packed red cells uh, like we have done. And it took uh, 30 years for the, world ever put for the world to come back. So in the OB literature published in 2009 uh, was packed red cells versus whole blood. And uh, I won't bore you with it other than to say that increasingly whole blood is being uh, available and at uh, UCSF at San Francisco General we can get whole blood when we want it and to me that makes one heck of a lot of sense rather than using packed cells and so that's an invitation for you to debate with me especially is there anybody from a blood bank here yeah especially if people are from blood banks okay uh, indications for blood and this is a tough one uh, in my mind it's when somebody is hemorrhaging like mad uh, there's no debate, but if somebody's lost, but when do you give blood? And obviously the correct one is that you uh, give blood when uh, the patient looks like they need blood by careful clinical evaluation. And the next one is where does the hemoglobin fit in all of this? And so uh, back in uh, 1996, uh, Dick Weisskopf published this and said uh, that it should not be dictated by a single hemoglobin level I've always enjoyed this slide because that's what he says. And then, by the way, Dick Weisskopf was, was from our department. But down here he says uh, it's rarely indicated when the hemoglobin is more than 10 and always indicated when less than 6. And I thought these two sentences contradicted each other a bit. But anyway, that's what it was. Uh, so um, the 1995 guidelines and the 2006 guidelines this, the conclusion is exactly the same. Blood transfusion is usually unnecessary when the hemoglobin is more than 10 and uh, when they're between 6 and 10. Other risk factors should be taken into account. And that makes a lot of sense. So that's 2006. Um, so why is there no difference between 1995 and 2006? And the answer is there's no ability to measure the adequacy of oxygen delivery and its efficacy in vital organs such as the brain, heart, et cetera, et cetera. And so the issue will be, should we be using hemoglobin in such an absolute sense as an indicator for a blood transfusion? That question is really important to answer, and I'm going to try and do that. But it's also important to do it because if it is important, uh, how should we be monitoring hemoglobin on a continuous basis? And I know you're doing studies or have done studies with uh, the hemoglobin sensor and we're doing, uh, it looks to me like rather similar studies. But in any event, um, the use of that monitor in part will be based on what the answer to the he that question is. Now, uh, just what hemoglobin is adequate. And uh, I realize this is a, a quoting an article with uh, anemia and end-stage renal disease uh, it is recent, uh, published in 2010, but in that case, in that uh, study, patients with hem uh, hematocrits less than 30 had an increased 
uh, mortality, and yet patients with had a hematocrit greater than 36 started to increase mortality. So there seems to be a range in which mortality rate is increased based on the hematocrit in this case. Now these are not surgical patients, these are patients with um, end-stage renal disease. And so should acute anemia, when it's 5.5 to 8, be an indicator for a transfusion? So in volunteers, uh, and this is Dick Weisskopf's study, they have an increase in heart rate, slowed reaction time, decreased self-assessed energy level. Is that good enough for us to take an anesthetized patient and say they should have a transfusion? Uh, acute anemia also impairs cognitive function uh, and memory, which is reversed by giving fresh blood. And uh, for the blood bankers, I'm not really, don't mean fresh blood, but just giving uh, red blood cells. So um, that suggests that having patients at hemoglobins of six or so is really not a good idea because in somebody that's not having surgery doesn't do well by it, should we be doing it to somebody that is having surgery? So perioperative uh, anemia increases mortality in non-cardiac patients by fivefold. Once again, if you want to read the article, this is where I'm getting the information. And so over 7,750, increased requirement of transfusions, treatment of anemia may reduce the risk, and this is um, uh, part of the uh, conclusion, and I'm going to move on. So of 3,000, uh, do blood transfusions uh, increase uh, mortality? And the answer is that they do not. Again, the article for this uh, appeared in uh, anesthesiology in 2008, and this is the title of it. 3,000 patients, uh, 1,000 received more than one or more tr transfusions. Direct relationship between mortality rate and number of transfusions. Transfusions not associated with worse mortality rate. 30 days higher survival rate in patients receiving blood conclusion. Uh, conclusion, blood transfusions associated with increased mortality rate in IC, not associated in ICU patients. So again, that's in the anesthesia literature. This is the title of the uh, editorial that was written, uh, Liars, Damn Liars, and Propensity Scores. Uh, in any event, this was saying you should take the previous study and uh, be careful with it. But yet, uh, how do you do pr prospective studies and come up with an answer related to that previous slide. And I'm going through this pretty rapidly. Um, what hemoglobin level should, they trans should be the transfusion study, uh, trigger rather. And there are several studies which find better outcomes with aggressive transfusion, uh, less than 10 grams. And there, once again, are two references, uh, one of which is in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2001. Uh, if you take a bunch of Canadians and ask them what, this is a survey, and ask them, this was published in anesthesiology, all would transfuse at a minimum of seven, would transfuse at eight or nine, in patients who had these conditions. And I think in my case, um, I qualify for this transfusion, and there are a few of you, like John Eisel, I think that also qualifies. So. Uh, the indications for red blood cells, same as in 1996. Um, and I have come to the conclusion that we must use the hemoglobin and or guesses related to age and myocardial infarction. And how should continuous uh, hemoglobin monitoring be used? And so I think that needs to be uh, answered. And I'm gonna switch away from that and briefly just cover the age of blood uh, I think everybody knows that uh, blood uh, has a decreased 2, 3 dBG, a left shift in the oxygen dissociation curve and the storage lesion. And so um, in 2006, Weisskopf uh, did a study in volunteers. The conclusion of the study is older blood as good as new blood. Okay. So that uh, answers that. And in the last couple of years, however, that conclusion has been proven to perhaps be not good. Uh, Koch et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008 
talking about cardiac uh, patients had a decreased survival after heart surgery in patients who received blood older than 14 days and they had increased post-operative complications. Um, <clears throat> this is um, an editorial that was written, New Blood, Old Blood, and No Blood, in the New England Journal. I criticized it because um, it was, they used 14 days as the cutoff point. Um, the mean age of patients was 70 years, coexisting diseases, and cardiopulmonary bypass, and its influence. So Adamson's um, Conclusion was that you should be careful interpreting the previous conclusion because of uh, these coexisting diseases. Uh, another one uh, appeared in Anesthesiology <coughs> News. Uh, this is where I saw it first. I don't like to quote that as a reference, uh, but um, there is lots of activity with regard to the age of the blood. The Cleveland Clinic uh, published uh, 2,800 patients about 14 day versus greater than 20 days. And uh, the Canadians uh, did the same thing. Theirs was fewer than eight days. And when you add this all up, it says that in certain patients, having blood that's less than 14 days is more desirable than having blood older than 14 days. So uh, before I get to that, and so the conclusion from this is, and it really hasn't been worked out, is just how much should we pay attention to the age of blood when we're giving uh, patients. In our blood bank, um, I said, okay, if I'm, if I'm having surgery, what's to stop me from saying, uh, even though I don't fall into one of these risk categories other than my age, what's to stop me from saying, gee, I don't, I don't want blood that's more than 14 days. Can we put a demand on the blood bank to do that? And the answer is we can't do that or else the blood bank will have real difficulty. But just know that the age of blood is really coming up as an issue. Okay, uh, this appeared in anesthesiology. Uh, and obviously, if it proves to be true, uh, it could uh, be a restrictor on the amount of blood given here as the reference. Age red blood cells, older than nine days, uh, promoted progression of, of lung cancer in rats, a fourfold increase in lung tumor retention, twofold increase in mortality rate. And so this is another argument, a study in rats uh, for using younger blood. Uh, an editorial written by, gosh darn it. An editorial written um, uh, used the cancer uh, paper to encourage a restrictive policy, hypothesized that the transfused red cells became targets to host immunocytes, and uh, Western Australia has been uh, very restrictive on blood because of this concern and others. Um, can blood cause anaphylaxis? And I'm um, here just to say this is uh, one that's described in the literature. And so uh, lastly, uh, in 2001, uh, I predicted that in 20 years, human blood will not be used as a blood transfusion, at least for the purpose of delivering oxygen. And the reason I believe this was uh, the various synthetic blood products and uh, this was reviewed in 2009 in uh, anesthesiology. Uh, obviously, these products cause kidney damage, coronary artery vasoconstriction. You all know about this. And uh, so then the real clincher came with Natanson, who published his uh, article in uh, JAMA and did a meta-analysis of 3,700 uh, patients, 16 trials, increased risk in death and myocardial infarction as a result of having uh, oxygen, synthetic oxygen, it's, uh, ox oxygen carriers or synthetic blood as I like to call them. Natanson, by the way, is an anesthesiologist who trained in our department uh, and is with uh, the NIH now. Uh, but in any event, uh, this certainly uh, makes it look not as good, but yet uh, there have been other articles that have still been encouraging with regard to synthetic blood. So the future of clinical trials uh, and blood substitutes, this is an editorial by Ferguson, 
and you can read this uh, by yourself, blood supplies have never been safer. And uh, he's stating what kind of studies need to be done. So uh, I've gone through this rather rapidly. My purpose was to bring you up to date with the literature. Uh, I struggled through a little bit of it because I don't believe it myself. Um, some of the conclusions I've, came, I've come up with, but I thought you should be aware of them. Uh, it's easy to keep up with transfusion medicine, by the way, uh, because um, virtually every important article uh, that appears with transfusion, artic uh, transfusion medicine, not exclusively, in the New England Journal, uh, the CDC reports in JAMA, uh, also in the uh, anesthesiology and anesthesia and analgesia. So one way or another, either by official reports such as the CD report or uh, via review articles, you will have access to the latest information regarding transfusions. So I want to uh, first uh, say I apologize for getting a little bit sentimental about my uh, military uh, uh, experience, but uh, in any event, it was important. It was, a, and as I said, I try, was not able to get out of going. And I have to say, at this point in my career, I've taken the 10 issue, uh, 10 situations that have been most influential in my life, and there's no question that that was a tremendous benefit to me. So I'm deeply indebted to the military and everything they're doing as it relates to tr trauma medicine. Thank you very much. Sure. We got time for a few questions. I hope there might be one or two, maybe, or three or four. Um, Carol Marshall, Department of Pathology, Blood Bank. I have a question about your massive transition protocol in San Francisco. I wonder if you developed one there, and uh, if you have, are you having any problems with keeping up with the plasma demands for your patients, and how do you handle them? Yeah. The uh, answer is we do have a massive transfusion protocol that's used uh, predominantly at San Francisco General Hospital, which is uh, where all the trauma, virtually all the trauma um, goes in San Francisco. So uh, that is the dominant one for us. I personally don't use it because I'm not stationed there, but that's where our massive uh, transfusion is. Uh, the um, University Hospital does virtually no emergencies other than those we create <laughs> <laughs> internally. And so uh, those are all, we work with the Irwin Blood Bank and our own blood bank, and we've not had shortages except with platelets. And that's why um, we've decided to not be quite so strict with the donor pool with regard to platelets. Sure. Well, I just have more than one comment that the American Board of Pathology offers a you know, boarded specialty in transfusion medicine, and that's those training programs are open to anesthesiologists. They only have to do one year of training. And I know there are a number of anesthesiologists that are trained in the country. And I just wanted to let the group know we've just started a fellowship in transfusion medicine yeah. here. We, we're starting in July, and we have a position open for 2011. I learned about, uh, just uh, to let you know, I learned about that uh, sometime this afternoon, and my enthusiasm for that is enormous. Uh, I don't know whether the statistic is still valid or not, but anesthesiologists, one way or another, give about half the blood in the United States. And I can tell you for sure that if, in my younger days, if such a, if I, if a fellowship were available, I would have taken it. So. Uh, I would strongly uh, support that. We need people who have expertise in, in blood therapy and blood, uh, blood, blood banking. Yeah. You should, uh, there aren't other questions, but I can't emphasize too much uh, that I really believe uh, transfusion medicine is changing fairly rapidly. And, um, Maybe one article by itself doesn't uh, make things change. But when you put this all together, like I tried to do in a hurry, 
there's a lot going on. And uh, as it relates to the age of the blood, the donor pool, that's already, in, well, by the way, is your donor pool any different than ours? Right. Well, that's the same, same as, yeah, the platelets are too short. Yeah. For the last 40 years, we have been giving our open heart cases about less than five days of age. We've always done it. Where are you? Here. Here. Like, um, how did you pick five rather than eight or three? We, I shouldn't say this, I'll get my blood bank uh, colleagues upset at me, uh, but uh, the surgeons I was with and I have talked about this. Uh, we, um, when we got into the coagulopathies that I was describing and have been published, um, our source of treatment was fresh blood from Marines. And um, they were tested, uh, but not because in those days we weren't testing for all the diseases that we test for now. And we all agreed that we were very biased observers. But we also agreed there's something about fresh blood that doesn't exist in blood that's been stored a while. And that's, uh, can't prove it, but it sure uh, seems like it is very, very effective in those kind of situations. Yes? As, as you may or may not be aware, that tradition can Overseas now, um, Darren Daniels, one of the cardiac guys here, has deployed to Iraq in 2004. The whole blood uh, tradition continues. If you, you need massive transfusion, you, you call the Marines or enlist the guys on base that are donating, and you transfuse them, it works. Well, they, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I think it was on one of my slides, and, t and said you were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, maybe you can. Uh, set me straight. Uh, my understanding is that a certain number of soldiers are pre-tested. I've forgotten what they called it. But are pre-tested so you know what the, whether they're infective or something like that. Be it sounds similar. I was, last time I was there in 2004. Okay. And, but we had something similar where everyone was tested and so you sent out, especially with the American troop that got injured. Right. Right. But w they had already been tested before. Yeah. Well. Right. There's a f there's a phrase that they used, um, and it was in one of my slides, and I just skipped over it. But they had a, as I understand it, they had a list of people that have already been tested. And all they needed to do then was point, and they've got them. We didn't have such a list. Uh, we tested them, but it took uh, for whether they were, well, we gave type-specific blood a lot. And, uh, but the principles are the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. There's, there's just uh, two, th two things. One is so that your trip, you have something to remember it by. Okay. There's a, a pass to get you out of the parking garage. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> and then the other is that your name will be actually added to the oh, uh, plaque Thank that sits you. in the Terrific. library that gives the list of your distinguished predecessors. And uh, we really appreciate you spending Thank the time with us. Thank you very much. Making the trip up. Good. There is a reception upstairs in the library. For those of you intimidated, ask questions in the large group. Please feel free to join us and uh, for a little bit of conversation, cheese and wine. I appreciate you all coming. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Good. Yeah, make sure it's
until turned on. Thank you very much.